Uh, so many people who have uh, a history of abuse or neglect have felt like um, they don't know themselves. They've had those, those days, those moments, or even just a perpetual feeling of, I don't know who I am. Some have said it's because they've spent so much time faking emotions that now they feel like they don't know who they really are. They don't know how they actually feel. Um, they may have difficulty identifying their emotions. Um, and for a variety of reasons, people get to a point in their life where they feel like they don't know who they are. Um, now, this is not like an amnesia, like in the movies where someone wakes up and they're like, I don't know who I am. And then they go on uh, a quest to find out their true identity and to prove uh, that there's some big conspiracy. Uh, this, is much, um, this is much deeper and more confusing because they know who they are in the sense of they know their name. And they know their, their, their title, or they know they're a fireman, they know they're a teacher. They may know their parents, uh, but when they say they don't know who they are, they're talking about a deeper, more existential crisis that they're experiencing. They're saying, I don't know who I am inside. I, I, I'm not connected to my core where I feel like I'm confident in my personal identity. And so this is a very serious issue because it creates ripple effects in every area of a sufferer's life. When you don't feel like you know who you are, you don't feel like you know how to respond uh, to all of the little issues and crises that come up. Uh, they, you don't feel like you can make decisions. You don't feel confident in your decisions. Uh, so this really creates a very big crisis uh, for, for those who are suffering from it. A lot of times this is because they had a harsh parent or harsh caregivers that didn't validate their identity, uh, that didn't validate their emotions. So if your caregiver uh, was constantly telling you that you need to smile even though you're not happy and uh, they don't want to see you crying, they don't want to hear your complaints, uh, they don't validate your arguments and your point of view. Uh, all of these things can start to contribute to the erosion of the self. And if the stakes felt very high as a child, like I could get beat or made to feel really bad if I go against uh, what my caregivers are saying or if I upset them in any way with my adverse emotions, uh, those stakes can make you feel like, okay, the better option for me is to just pretend or fake my emotion or change my, my viewpoint or my opinion to go with the status quo here. And that is survival for children in uh, abusive homes and uh, a major contributor to complex post-traumatic stress as a result. And so uh, there's no shortage of superficial advice uh, even some experts have given advice that I would warn against on how, how to find yourself. Um, for instance, many experts say that you need to identify with your authentic self. So those of you who have done, who have done work and, and read the books, you, you've heard about this concept of the authentic self. And so the, the concept is basically like uh, there's a you and you can find that you, but it's somewhere in your memory and you got to go back to your childhood and there you'll find your authentic self before you started making changes to your opinions, your thoughts, your beliefs, your emotions. Uh, you go back to how you originally were, the way that you originally acted or what is your knee jerk response in certain, certain situations? What is your first emotion? That's your authentic self. Um, this concept is, is very popular, and I understand that maybe even some of you may have identified with this concept and, and, uh, and attempted this. Uh, however, it can be problematic because it's just not universally true. Now, for instance, for myself as a child, um, I was everything but authentic a lot of times. Um, I was the undisputed class clown. I wanted to be an actor. I would pretend to be a different person 
depending on which kids I was hanging out with or if I was at home or if I was at school or wherever I was, I was acting just a little bit different everywhere I would go or sometimes completely different. Um, so there was nothing really authentic. I, I would fake my emotions. Like I remember when my, my little brother was born, I saw on TV that kids would get jealous when they had a new sibling. So I acted like I was jealous that I had a new sibling. I wasn't. My, my, I, I didn't feel a lack of attention, but I acted like I had a lack of attention just to stir up some drama and just kind of see what happened. And um, so, so the idea, if you were to tell me now, go back and find your authentic self. My authentic self was a, a dramatic troublemaker. Like I, that, that's, I don't think that's the true me. What that is, is that's the childhood version of myself. Uh, so for all of us, it, it's not going to work for us to go back and to find the more authentic version of ourselves. The reality is I'm more authentic now than I've ever been. In fact, I have to remind myself to smile at strangers and, uh, and then not talk to myself while I'm walking down the street because I've done so much work on myself that I am 100% comp uh, comfortable with who I am. And I have uh, no qualms or sense of loss as to who I am. Um, I would never ask that question, who am I? Uh, now I have found my authentic self, but whatever was in my childhood, that was not going to be where I'm going to discover my authentic self. So for yourself and for those of you who are listening, how can you find yourself? So this concept is pushed in movies, television, where you go off on a quest. Maybe you pack a backpack and you go camping in the wilderness or you go on a hike. And then some point when you're standing on a bluff, uh, you're supposed to find yourself, maybe uh, overlooking a sunset. Or maybe when you travel to the east and you study Buddhism, uh, then you will be able to find yourself. But again, all of these concepts are, are false narratives as to what it means uh, to be able to find yourself, to be able to know who you truly are. Uh, so I'm going to give you some true concepts that will help you to be able to find yourself. And if you have pen and paper, definitely you want to write these things down uh, because uh, this, this journey uh, that you're on, uh, you need to get it on the right course and you want to do that sooner than later so that you can have the joy, the peace, the serenity, and the confidence of knowing exactly who you are. So first of all, in order to find yourself, uh, you have to stop trying to find yourself. In order to find yourself, you have to stop trying to find yourself. And let me explain what I mean by that. When Thomas Edison uh, created the light bulb, he did not find the light bulb. He did not say, I would like to go on a search to discover the light bulb. The light bulb is something that had to be invented. Now, there are things that can be discovered, like electricity, something that's intrinsic to nature. Um, but something that electricity powers, like a refrigerator, a light bulb, um, or any other electronic device, those things have to be made. They have to be invented. Likewise, who you are has to be made. It has to be created. It has to be designed. You have to, it's something that you have to actually decide upon. Who you are is not something that's intrinsic to nature. You will not just find it by going out and doing a search, like it'll be off on a bluff or on the top of a mountain somewhere or something like that. That's just not true. Who you are doesn't exist, pre-exist you outside of nature and you just go find it. Um, you don't come out of the womb already who you are. Uh, who you are is something that's created and built over time, is designed. And this is good news uh, because you can stop searching and you can start designing when you understand what the self really is. All of us look in the mirror and we think we're looking at ourselves, but in reality, aren't you just looking at your physical body? Isn't it true that when you look in the mirror, 
you're not really seeing yourself in, in its entirety. You're just seeing your physical body. When we say me or you, we're not just referring to someone's physical presence, just their body. We're talking about something deeper, right? When you say, I don't know who I am, you don't mean if I saw myself in the mirror, I can't recognize myself. So we're talking about something beyond the physical body. So the self, the metaphysical self is what in psychology they call the ego. So you have to understand that what you're trying to understand is something that's beyond the physical. It's in the metaphysical. It's the self, this ego, this, this, this construct of ideas, beliefs, values, personality, experiences, everything that we, uh, we know to be the self, who we are, exists within our mind. That's not to say, oh, it's all in your mind, so it's not real. It is very real. It is very real. It's just that it's not physical. It's something that exists within our mind, but it's very real. It is a construct. But that construct is so important for us to feel complete, for us to feel happy, for us to feel confident, for us to move forward. We have to know who we are. And you can find yourself by switching the focus from searching to designing, to building who you are. Let's go deeper to understand this. That self that sits in your mind, what is the self actually made of? The physical body, which is a part of yourself, it's a part of who you are, but it's not the metaphysical self. The physical body is made up of what? Well, scientists say cells. In fact, scientists say that you are what you eat. So literally what you take into your body, the body breaks it down through a process and it takes the nutrients and actually builds cells for your body and it sheds off old cells. So you're actually made up of physical matter, uh, which is being supported by the food that you continue to take in. So we're, we're built up of something our, our physical body is. But what about the metaphysical self that exists only in the mind? What is it made up of? At its core, the self is made up of your values. This is very important to understand. In order to master your emotions, in order to understand the self, you must understand what the self is actually made of. The metaphysical self is made up of your values. Your values, what I'm referring to, is anything you find important, anything you truly believe in, that is what the self is made up of. That can be friendship, ideas like love, um, trust, um, finding communication to be important, finding relationships to be important, finding solitude to be important. Those are your values. It can also be material things and so-called shallow things. Your PlayStation 5 could be one of your values. Your car could be one of your values. If it's highly important to you, then that's your value. And what makes it different for everyone to have a different self, a different personality, uh, a different um, state of being, is that we all have slightly different values. And what makes us work as a society is where we share some of the same values. But the values are the building blocks of the self. That is why you have emotions, especially intense emotions. Your emotions are the metaphysical self's way of interacting with the outside world, of appreciating it, enjoying it, but also warning you when there is something in your perceived reality that is a threat to the metaphysical self. The same way your physical body has the nervous system to warn you if there's something that's a threat to your physical body, it sends you pain, right? So if your hand is on a stove or you touch something sharp, it sends a, uh, an immediate reaction up to the brain that's, uh, that you calculate as being pain. It's unpleasant. So you pull your hand away and you protect the physical body. 
your emotional system is built similarly. So you get emotional pain when there's something in your perceived reality that is violating your values. Think about it. Every time you get emotional pain, it is because there is something that is violating your values. Your girlfriend breaks up with you. The reason why you feel pain is because you valued that relationship, you valued your girlfriend or something that she brought to the table. If you didn't value your girlfriend, would you feel hurt or any emotional pain if she broke up with you? No, you would not. In fact, isn't that why as a defense mechanism we say, I don't care. When something hurtful happens, someone uh, goes and spreads a rumor about you to everyone in your workplace and you say, I don't care. And you say that as a defense mechanism, people do this to defend themselves because they know intrinsically that when you separate the value from the, re from the violation in the perceived reality, then you don't feel the pain. So they're taking their value system and they're changing it. They're saying, oh, I don't care what people think of me. That way, when people don't think well of me, it doesn't hurt me. By, by changing your values, you protect yourself from the emotional pain. People intrinsically know that. Uh, but, but what I'm giving to you is so that you're taking it out of just the intrinsic subconscious understanding and getting a conscious working understanding of what's actually happening with your emotional pain. All of your anxiety is there because your subconscious is just trying to warn you about something in your perceived reality that is a threat to your value system. It's just, it's that simple. Maybe you think your boyfriend's cheating on you. So you're, you've created a perceived reality in your mind. The subconscious doesn't know whether the reality that it's perceiving is something in the outside world, something from a dream, something from a memory, or something from your imagination. It doesn't care. It can come from any of those four sources that I just named, and it will still send you anxiety. You can literally be having a dream about your boyfriend cheating on you, and you will wake up with anxiety if you value your relationship and you value your boyfriend. Because that perceived reality is a violation of your personal values. It's a violation of the self because the self is made up of the values. Your body is trying to protect the self. Your subconscious mind stores the value system. It stores it like a code. And when there's something in, you, in, in your outside world that goes against those values, it gives you the emotions. So imagine uh, two people are walking down the street and they witness a horrific car accident. One woman goes, oh my goodness, this is terrible. We have to do something. Are they okay? I can't believe this. I'll call 911. She's frantic. She's shaking. She's sweating, right? She's got all of these emotions. The guy next to her witnessed the same exact car accident. And he goes, that's life in the big city. And then he keeps on walking. He has virtually no emotional detectable reaction to the same situation. What does that show? Well, for one, the situation does not dictate the emotions. So you can stop saying you made me mad or that got me upset because the reality is that the situation does not dictate your emotions. What it is is that your perceived reality violated your value system. For the woman, she got emotional because she values human life. She values kindness to strangers. She values being helpful. She values peace, harmony, uh, not seeing car wrecks. So now when something like this happens in front of her, her, all those values are suddenly being violated and her emotions get all up in, in, in a tizzy, right? But the guy, he just had a different set of values. He doesn't care about strangers. Just his personal set of values. He doesn't care about people he doesn't know. And maybe he's worried about getting to work on time. Different values. So his emotional reaction is different. So hopefully you understand this concept between uh, the emotions, uh, your perceived reality, and your values. 
In the future, we'll be able to talk more about that on how to control those emotions and solve your anxiety, solve your depression. But in terms of what we're talking about now, which is the self and how to find yourself, what you have to do is work on building your values. So step one, and there's two steps in finding yourself. Step number one is to design the self. You'll design the self by studying people that you admire, by uh, studying religious texts that are true, by finding your values. That's something you can actually search for, your values. You're going to do this by reading, by taking in knowledge, and keep it flexible because every single person on this earth, no matter how centered and how actualized they are, they are still on a quest. They are still working towards, they are still in an ever-evolving process of building themselves, improving themselves. Every person should be continually working on themselves. So don't feel bad if you find yourself making slight adjustments to your values as you move forward in life. The reality is, you have to continue to change your values as you grow. Because as you learn more things and take in more knowledge and wisdom and understanding, you need to evolve as a person. You need to grow. The self is ever changing, ever growing. So who you are today is not exactly who you are tomorrow. So don't feel bad that you don't know who you are. It's just that you need to take time to establish your values. Then, step two, you need to live each day striving to live up to those values. This is your journey, and as a as a as a big as a big part, it's your purpose in life to strive each day to live up to your values. But please understand, everyone has the responsibility to strive to live up to their values. So just because you violated a value today, you don't have to go back into existential crisis and say, I don't know who I am anymore. I violated one of my values today. No, you catch yourself. You recognize what happened. Okay, I got a little upset and I value serenity and peace and I got upset. I went a little bit outside myself today. But that's okay because I know who I am. Because who you are is who you want to be. Who you are is who you want to be until the day you die. Who you are is who you want to be. And then when you're who you were, it's who you were every day. People will then decide for you, this is who that person was based on their track record. So strive each day to live up to your values. If every person, and a part of your values is going to be helping other people, and if every person just dedicated 50% of their potential to, to living up, to helping everyone else, we would live in a utopia. If they, if they dedicated their, their, just a piece of their potential to actually benefiting mankind and benefiting one another, we would live in a paradise. So please, once you establish your values, Work and strive every day to live up to them and continually keep on refining that. For those of you who are in this group and they identify with this concept and they felt like before this, this discussion, like they didn't know who they were, please don't feel bad. In reality, you are in a very strong position if you came into this feeling like you didn't know who you were. Because you are closer to being able to find the best version of yourself. Because you are closer to being able to design it. Because you have a blank canvas sitting in front of you. The people who need to worry are those who are rigid and say, I am what I am and I'm never going to change. Those are the people I worry about. Because you can be locked in, whether it was from childhood or whatever experiences, to racism, bigotry, and violence, and loving and valuing things that ultimately are a detriment to other people around you. Those individuals, 
those individuals I worry for. But you, the blank canvas, that's beautiful because you can start painting tonight. And what you come up with, I pray it will be beautiful. So at this time, I'm going to open up the discussion. Uh, Ed, you want to go ahead? Sure, I'll share. Um, this is the first time that I've ever done anything like this. Uh, I've been searching for resources for a long time now. Um, back in May, I finally addressed uh, my childhood sexual abuse that happened about 22 years ago. Uh, I went through middle and high school just fine with being able to live with it. My mid-20s to late 20s, I was single, so if I didn't want to do something or I felt depressed or I felt anxious, I just could stay at home whenever I wanted to. Um, but I recently had a spouse, uh, and she had two kids prior to us meeting. And then we had a daughter in January of this year. And eventually my mental capacity could not withhold all the things that were going on. And it broke in a bad way in May. And that was when I needed, knew I needed to get help. And I, I really like the val looking for your core values and trying to see what you really are so that you can live by that. I appreciate that, Ed. That's a, that's a very touching story. Thank you for sharing that. I want to give an opportunity if someone else wants to comment. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, my story is similar to Ed's. Only thing is that I wasn't married. <laughs> um, but I was with somebody who I knew for a very long time. We knew each other since middle school. And it was one of those things where we separated. It's whatever, middle school, right? Who cares? And then at some point, we found each other back. And it, like we kept found it, finding each other and bumping into each other. And so we finally decided to like make it work. Uh, and not make it work, but to be in a relationship together. And we were like best friends. I felt like, you know, I've known him. He knew me all my life. You know, parents knew each other, everything. It was great. But I kind of did the monkey branching thing for a long time in my early 20s, jumping from relationship to another. And they were all super abusive. I remember one relationship, I realized this year, like last month, that one of the guys was grooming me. I mean... I was 16 and he was 23. And at the time, I didn't even know that was an issue, right? I'm just like, oh, he's a great guy, right? But he did things to me that he should not have done. Um, and I, you know, said stop, tried to put up the boundaries and, you know, things got out of control anyway. So I just, I realized I started dealing with my trauma much later and it affected the relationship with the guy that I wanted um in a really bad way. So things just ended really bad. And I just realized that I was holding all my baggage and all my trauma. And at the end of the day, it got casted onto someone who didn't deserve it. Um, but it's because I didn't know. I thought me being over the person was me being over the stuff, <laughs> but it's not the same thing. And I realized that you just need to take that time. And so now here I am taking that time and rediscovering who I am rediscovering the things that happened to me as a child into, you know, my adolescence and onward and just, you know, making sure that I make the right decisions from here on out. And so, yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm starting over. <laughs> Kayla, I resonate with you a lot on that. Uh, those same exact feelings are what I'm feeling right now. And it's just great to be able to sit in a room like this and know that other people have the exact same stories or similar stories and the feelings are all very, very similar. Yep. Thank you so much, Kayla. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, I was so Okay. So, Ashley, why don't you go ahead first, and then we'll get Nefertari's comments. Um, I was wondering if I, this is my first meeting, um, so I'm not sure, um, you know, kind of following along, but I was hoping that we could maybe discuss that step two that you discussed in the last, you know, in, 
and your just got your sharing um purpose in life is to strive each day to live up to your values i feel like my i feel like i'm at sort of in conflict with that because it feels like it's a lot of pressure <laughs> it's a lot of pressure to sort of like live up even to your own values especially if like your values are like you know I don't know like at a hundred percent all the time like how do you continue to strive to that every single day when like your values are maybe too intense or too much or like too um yeah I'm a little I'm at a little bit of a conflict with that that's a that's a really really great question. I think a lot of people probably feel the same way, so we definitely should address that. Uh, but what I would ask Ashley is, if you think about it, um, every day, do you think you try to not live up to your values every day? I think I try too hard to live up to my values. I feel yeah. like my values are like, you know, like I was mad at myself yesterday because I snapped at. I left, no, I didn't snap at someone. I left a really passive aggressive voicemail to like a receptionist at a psychiatrist office for this bill that I've been getting that I just can't afford to pay. You know, and that's like part of like, I don't like being that way, but it's like sometimes you do it because you kind of snap, <laughs> you know, you've been, um, you try so hard. All right. So, so ultimately what the real problem is is that um, that it's difficult to live up to high standards and that you tend to set high standards and high values for yourself. But the problem is not that um, you don't want to live up to your values or you don't want to uh, continually strive to be a better person. So in a situation like yours, uh, you have to let go of the concept of powerlessness. Um, so, so much we feel like uh, I can't control my emotions, uh, which sort of bleeds into I can't control my actions. And also, you may be living by a set of principles sometimes that are not totally designed by you, but you learned from society or was put onto you by your parents. What step two is all about is coming into your power. So first step is you're, you're going to wipe everything off. And you're going to design your choice in values. This is not going to be what you think you should do. This is not going to be what your parents always told you or what uh, your church group says. This is what you've decided you personally want to live up to and feel is reasonable for every human to live up to. If it's not something that other people could live up to, then it really shouldn't be on your list of, of things that, that you want to accomplish or, or be because you're just being unrealistic. And we have a tendency to do that to ourselves, like give myself a job or a task or, or something that no one, other people could never live up to it. Like I will never tell a lie. And then that's my, my goal. And then I feel bad because of course I'm going to mess up and say something that's not totally true. And then it just becomes a, a cycle, which leads into the next point. So the first point is make sure that the values that are on your list are designed by you and that you're putting them there and they're realistic. The second thing is not being too hard on yourself and self-sabotaging when you don't meet a goal. Just like if you're doing a diet and you cheat a little on the diet, the last thing you want to do is say, oh, I cheated on my diet, so I might as well go ahead and pig out. Like. You just have to stop and say, oh, I did eat that piece of chocolate I shouldn't have, but I'm just going to stop and and catch myself back and say, now I'm going to get straight. So if you find yourself snapping on someone on the phone, the best thing to do is to stop, sit back and ask yourself, why did I become emotional? Oh, Roman said you become emotional because your values are being violated. So probably I lost control or I became emotional because there was some value that was violated. Now, what was it? You go back and you realize she made you feel stupid because she said this and that. And you value not being made to feel stupid. You value people looking at yourself as being smart. So the way that you protect yourself 
is to get mad at someone who makes you feel stupid. Now you realize this is one of your values. She violated one of your values. Now, do I want to keep this value and change the behavior? Or do I want to change the value so that it doesn't get it doesn't trigger me? Now you'll make that choice. Now I might decide I want to keep this value because I like I I always want people to not make me feel and look stupid. Okay, fine. Now I have to change my behavior. The actions are 100% in your control. The emotion will always get triggered by the violation of the value. That's an automated system in your mind. But your action is totally in your control. So you can decide someone can literally violate your, your value and you can just sit here just like that. You can feel all the emotion inside, but you don't have to snap. You don't have to go crazy. The actual action you take, sitting still, yelling, breathing, whatever you do, that's 100% in your control. So to you, Ashley, and to anyone else who also is vicariously living through that question, come into your power. Design it on purpose. Live up to it on purpose. Can I ask one more thing? Or maybe sure. be, like bounce off of that? I feel like... I'm also hearing you say, because now I'm thinking, oh, what if my perception of values or my idea of values has been <laughs> also very tight to me? And I guess I haven't done a values exploration in a while. Um, but I always kept trying to bring it down to like one word, right? So like my my value is compassion or my value is um, self-awareness. Um a value can also be self-expression, right? But I'm also kind of hearing you say that the value can be more than that. I mean, it doesn't even have to be one word. It's like I, my value being triggered in sort of your example is that someone made me feel bad. And that's like also a value. It's That can be a value to protect yourself. Um, cool. That's it. That's just kind of what I was hearing you say. You got it. There are dozens of values. It's not going to be like super sweet and cute. It's like dozens of things that every single person values, things that you don't even think of. So one way you can find your values is by reverse engineering. And that's looking at what things have made me feel anxious, what things have made me feel emotionally intense. Anything that's got an emotional connection to it, it's a value. If you see a cute puppy and you go, oh, that's because you value cute things. If you see uh, someone, a kid get slapped and you get angry, that's because you value children not being abused. So you have dozens of values. Absolutely. It's not just one thing. I do want to give uh, Nefertiri a chance to jump in. Yeah. Um, I think just going uh, to like the point of like who you are is, is like kind of what you choose to be kind of like what you value um rather than this kind of i don't know mystical kind of thing where it's like i have to go on a quest to kind of find who i really was um i think that really resonated with me because um something that i struggled with when i went no contact with my dad um it's just very narcissistic and stuff is that i was it was such an emotionally incestuous relationship that it was very hard for me to separate. Is this what I want? Is this my voice talking to me or is it my father? Um, you know, my dad, he was always a very image conscious person. He wanted me to go to Harvard. You know, I had to, like, I had to be at the pinnacle of success, you know, other, you know, otherwise I'm a loser or I'm a failure or I'm squandering opportunity. And um, he basically, I just felt like a trophy to kind of parade around because he would be like, oh, look, my daughter, she goes to Northwestern. Uh, see what a good parent I am. Um, never mind the years of kind of abuse, uh, physical, verbal. When I got older, I got a little money. It became financial um, that I had to endure in order to complete those four years. and. You know, after I went no contact, um, I really did. I did hit that kind of existential crisis because it's like, wow, this is not what I expected. I just went no contact with my family. I have no money. What the fuck am I going to do with my life? All my life I've been taught, you know, go through elementary, go to high school, go to college, get a good job, all that stuff. And now it's like, 
what am I going to do? <laughs> then this pandemic hits and stuff. And it really kind of forced me to kind of reevaluate some of the things that I had been taught. And I think to kind of go to Ashley's point about, you know, not knowing, like, I guess, like how to set the value, what values do you set for yourself and stuff? I think the most important thing that we can do and the best thing we can do is really just be open to exploring different things. Like for instance, um, I realized after I lived in a commune with seven people that even though I love those people, I love being community, eating dinner, I really need my alone time. And so that I ended up exploring what was it like to live by myself, which was scary, you know, with the pandemic and me going through a breakup and stuff. But seven months later, I realized, wow, I really like, like being alone, you know? And when I felt that I was too isolated and stuff, cause I was in my house, I was like, okay, what can I do to like get more socialization to kind of create that balance for myself? And that's what got me into the meetups and stuff. But I think if I hadn't been willing to take that risk and to explore a different way of life, how would I ever know like what is right for me and what I value? You nailed it. Absolutely. iPhone 6. Your hand is up, iPhone 6, but I don't I don't know your name. Your hand is up, iPhone 6. Do you want to make a comment? I was going to add to that if I can. Go ahead, Ed. iPhone 6, you just have to unmute yourself if you want to jump in. Go ahead, Ed. Um, that story about get graduating college and not knowing what she was going to do, um, I totally understand that. And I think that's why one of the reasons they say that mental health conditions most often pop up between 24 and I think 35 is the age. Um, because I feel like people get to a point where they get done with college and the real world hits and you owe money for the, the, the college degree that you got and you have to start a job and that brings on more pressure. The financial situation brings on pressure. And then sometimes your, your mental health or your brain itself can't actually hold all that. And I, I like to think of it as like putting laundry in your laundry basket. So when you put laundry in your laundry basket, eventually it gets full, but you push it down a little bit to just add a few more things, but eventually it starts overflowing and you can't, you're, you're done by that point. It's already too much. Yeah, absolutely. You want to go ahead, iPhones? And they're gone. I don't know what happened. Oh, no, they're back. I don't know. They might be having uh, technical difficulties. Does anyone else want to want to make a comment? Nefertari, I, I feel like you nailed it. It's uh, it's definitely an issue of uh, self discovery. Um, so you already you all already have some values that you're you're walking around with right now. Um, so once you discover what those values are, that's a part of the concept of what you're looking for in terms of finding yourself. And you're going to discover those values by reverse engineering back from the things that really make you emotional that you get passionate about. Once you trace it back and you say, wow, I really got angry about that or that is this is what made me depressed. It, it expresses the negative emotions express something beautiful about you. When you find yourself depressed, there's usually something beautiful that actually is making you feel depressed, which can sound really crazy. But a lot of times you'll go back and you'll realize, okay, why am I depressed? I got really depressed because blah, blah, blah. And you go back and it's like, oh, it's because my dad had cancer. And it's like, wow, I got depressed because another person was suffering because I love my dad so much. It's, it expresses something beautiful. So it's a value. And when you trace your emotions and you go back to what the causes are, you will find a lot of very beautiful values that you already hold. But if you find some that are that are dumb, like, wow, I got really mad when someone scratched my car. My car, I don't want that to be a big value to me. That's dumb. If you decide that, it's up to you. 
and you can make it less of a value. Now you strive each day to diminish the value of something like that in your life by literally getting rid of it or by just putting less emphasis on it. Um, so each day you journal what you're doing, but you notice, you know, okay, I am my values. So I'm going to wake up to tomorrow and I've learned about myself. And I also have decided that I want to be the type of person that pursues this, that the next thing you wake up, you strive to live to those, to those values, but you're going to learn that day, new things. You're going to learn new things all the time. And you should be striving to, should be reading these meetup groups. You should be talking with people. You're going to learn fantastic things and that's going to bring more values to the table. To the table iPhone, you have your hand up still. Did you want to make a comment? Hi. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name is Charlotte. I'm going to go ahead and fix that for the next um, group. So you actually have a name um, with, okay, with the phone. Okay. So um, I have some abandonment issues. My mother, she, she left me when I was a, a baby with my grandparents and my father. Um, I think he just didn't like her. So he took his anger out on me growing up and it was really, really tough. Um, so I didn't feel a connection to any of my family. So as an adult, um, I'm, I'm sort of a people pleaser. I'm a people pleaser. Um, if I feel like I'm talking too long or if I feel like I'm a burden on someone, like I'll cut it short, even if the point hasn't been made, even if I didn't get clarification, I'll cut it short simply to, you know, like save the relationship. And um, there were some other things that happened when I was younger and my husband doesn't even know. And I feel like it's starting to, it's not affecting our relationship, but it is affecting me personally. And um, I really just want to get to the point where I can share that with him. He's such a pure soul. And he's like, he's pretty much had a really great upbringing, not too much, you know, trauma or drama in his life. So I, it's almost like, I don't want to tank that. I don't want him to look at me differently. Yeah. Everyone, as anyone that's struggling with people pleasing probably also struggles with feeling like they know who they are at times, um, if not always. Um, so really heart touching experience, um, Charlotte. I, I would advise if you, you, you have to first identify if your husband is a safe space. If, he, if he's not someone that's going to potentially utilize information against you uh, or do it in a harmful way, um, then, then you should consider um, overcoming your, your internal objectives, such as I don't want to expose him to the trauma. Um, if he's a pure soul and he's going to be supportive and he's going to be understanding, I would advise you consider deeply um, exposing him a little bit to some of the things that, that you're struggling with deep, deep down um, and uh, letting him know about some of these memories. Um, it could be terribly difficult or embarrassing to talk but you might try um, writing them down in an email or a text, talking to him ahead of time, letting him know um, that, uh, letting him know that you have something, come from a place of vulnerability, letting him know that you feel vulnerable and this is very difficult for you to express and you're really afraid of him looking at you differently. Um, and uh, and uh, if, if you're feeling comfortable to move forward, again, if he's a safe space, you 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 may find tremendous joy and release to give that to your spouse so that he can support you. Because I I am speaking as someone who has loved ones that suffer from complex trauma. It's very baffling and confusing from the outside, the, the behavior, if if you don't let us know what what's happening where it comes from what the deep the deep-seated insecurities we think it's us we think that you must be having some problem with us we must be inadequate in some way 
So it can be a tremendous gift when you when you let someone know. Um, but again, it's got to be a safe space. Otherwise, they can re-traumatize you. We got some really awesome comments coming in. I appreciate these. Um, let me go with Ashley for first here. I have a another question um, that I think kind of taps into even what um, iPhone six just shared. I'm sorry, you said you heard their name was Charlotte. Charlotte. <laughs> Charlotte. <laughs> I don't think Charlotte. Um, it could. I mean, I don't know. We discuss. Uh, I I also feel like there's this uh, sometimes clashing of values, right? Like that can also contribute to our insecurities with wanting to share things with other people. Um, you know, so I wonder what some coping skills might be, or what some ways of thinking about that look like or could be. Uh, can you be more specific? I didn't understand the question totally. The clashing of values? Yeah, I mean, like you said, everyone has different values, right? Like what one person finds important is not what someone else finds important. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that clashes, right, with your own personal values. Like to share an example, I'm struggling with a friend right now who is constantly complaining about the fact that she... <laughs> is struggling with money and money is a, a trigger for me too, because I, you know, to share a little of like my history, I like my mom pretty much was just like, I hate that you're leaving. Like I decided to move to Chicago for college and she was like, you're abandoning the, abandoning the family because we're insane. Like there's obviously some thing in there for her that she's had to deal with. And then, but instead of like, being normal she just like cut me out for two years and just didn't talk to me cold turkey so money has been an issue for me because like I moved here and I had to do it all like no support and you know I think everyone feels like that's something that they also share in common like with other people but sometimes the struggle is different depending on like what you're dealing with in society or like what the reality of society is and the reality of my friend situation is that like she has a decent job and she could easily like cut some of her financial worries if she just didn't talk or do some of the things that she does. Like she's financially supporting this person who like, I just, you know, I think sometimes we do our own self-sabotaging and that also feels like a conflict of my own value because it's just kind of like, I don't know how to help you. And I also don't know how to like be empathetic towards it. Cause it's like, the answer seems so simple to me and like, I don't know, maybe it's not. Okay, that's very good. Actually, I think, I, I'm glad you asked the question because I think this goes into a little bit of how I wanted to respond to Ed also and uh, some of the other comments about the fear of being judged, uh, not wanting to share uh, with certain people. And then on the flip side with yours, Ashley, just kind of feeling like you can't really empathize with certain people uh, because their values are different. Um, Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. We struggle with this as, as complex post-traumatic stress sufferers. Boundaries, you do not. You are not the other person. The other person is not you. That's the beautiful thing. You are one complete whole entity within yourself. So this woman, Charlotte, is in a marriage with, a, with another soul. Uh, this is something very special, very intimate. And if she can uh, trust this person, that's what I've said several times, if, 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 if this man is a safe space, then she should share because this spousal arrangement is one where two are, are attempting to become as close as two separate individuals can possibly become. That's what a marriage is all about. If you're not in a marriage with the person, please strongly consider not sharing very personal things with them because yes <laughs> they will judge sometimes and yes uh, or many times uh, their values may not line up so they can throw something that's very important to you directly into the trash and you're like pouring your heart out to them uh oversharing is is a problem so yeah for ed in, in your situation like you mentioned okay for a male saying 
I was sexually abused and then saying I was sexually abused by a male. It's socially right now, the society hasn't evolved to give you the type of um, comfort that we would give a female who was sexually abused. That's just where society is at right now. So unfortunately, since, well, that's, I, a, since that's a reality, you should not very openly and very readily share with different males that that exact experience because it can hurt you worse when they respond in an insensitive way because they're not ready for it. So what, yeah. you're, looking for, what you're looking for, Ed, is those safe spaces. And they're going to be the minority, the people who either share your values, someone like a spouse where, where you're in a relationship like what Charlotte has, a therapist, or a group like this, this creates more of a safe space. None of us here are judging because we were all abused too. Some of us sexually, emotionally. Uh, Nefertari talked about emotional incest. So absolutely, like we we understand. So you got more of a safe space here to talk about that. Um, but in my don't overshare with people who yeah. don't have that sensitivity. My my hardest part was going through my teenage years of the confusion of not really understanding what happened, um, being confused about my sexual orientation, um, which just led to not good relationships with any person um, throughout my adulthood to this point. Yeah, I feel you. Please protect the self uh, by not by not being too open with too many people um, because sometimes we make the wrong choice. Nefertari, go ahead. Yeah, I I think the reality is just um yeah, there's just a lot of stigma around like um I think being sexually abused, I mean being abused, um and you know, I like even I feel like with my experience, right? Like I was, my father is abusive, right? And people kind of mock um, women that have issues with their dads. Oh, it's daddy issues or whatever. Um, I know guys that literally are like, they target women that have issues with their dad because they have a low self-esteem and they know they're be, they would be more likely to tolerate abuse or whatever. Um, so yeah, something I've kind of just, I've learned um, is really like, I've learned just not to, not just to share those things um, with a lot of people. Um, but I think especially, I think that's what, what's made a, having a relationship for me difficult because I just don't expect to get any empathy from men in general. Um, I didn't have any empathy for my father. He, I could be crying in the face and he would just be like, what are you crying about? Like, I could do worse to you or like, I've been through worse than that. Um, and it doesn't help that I've had many experiences where I was uncomfortable. I mean, I had experience today where a guy was bothering and following me and I was uncomfortable and like, there was no consideration or, or understanding of like why it's not okay to follow me <laughs> and you know, all this stuff. And so, um, I definitely, I, yeah, it's unfortunate, but I just feel like I can't really share too much because I feel like um, I'll be viewed as damaged goods, um, so to speak, by a lot of guys. Um, and I've just experienced so much um, gaslighting um, throughout my life. So I just kind of avoid that. Um, but I also wanted to say something about with Ashley, just with her friend. Um, honestly, and this is going to be hard because like I struggled with this too, but I've literally had to tell, I've had to tell people like, yo, you need to share this with your therapist or someone else. <laughs> Cause I, I like, there was a guy, he was just telling me about all his trauma and how his wife left him. And it got to a point where it's just like, I can't deal with all this. Um, it's, you know, I'm going through my own things, but it's also what was frustrated me was just how unreciprocated it was. Like I've, I've had a tendency where um, 
I end up being people's emotional dumping ground, right? And I listen to them for hours, et cetera. But if I want to talk to them about something, they're like, oh, well, I'm tired. I got something. And it's like, I would get upset. But, you know, because it's like, wow, I'm expecting to be your, to just be there for you. But when I need a listening ear or something, that's a problem. Um, and so something I've learned is really to take a, a step back from kind of one side relationships. And that's something I'm struggling with, with my own sister who treats me as her emotional dumping ground. And I've also learned that like, I just can't get involved in people's business. Like there's crazy stuff having my sister and stuff, but I've learned that people sometimes you just need to let people figure stuff out on their own because the only way they're going to learn, unfortunately, some people only learn the hard way and you can advise them as much as you want, but it often takes people hitting rock bottom to finally realize, okay, I need to get rid of this relationship or I need to like get into rehab or I need to really change my life because this is no longer sustainable, but they have to get to that point themselves um, to really be receptive to that. So that's what I wanted to share. Good points, and we appreciate it. Uh, Ruby, I'm going to have you go next. I just want to uh, make a comment um, to that same to that same thought, which is uh, boundaries, again, with uh, with these friends who are dumping on us uh, because they, they notice that we're a highly emotional or uh, empathetic. I'm sorry. They notice we're empathetic, so then they want to dump. Uh, you have to set boundaries. Your boundary is your, your protection, the protection of the self. And so you have to literally ask yourself in terms of your values, if this person is, is actually benefiting you in your life or if they're more of a detriment in your life. And you have to pull away from and start pushing back on people who are more of a drain, even when they're family members, than a benefit. It should be a 50-50 beneficial situation. Every other relationship that's not 50-50 is a toxic, potentially draining relationship for you, especially being that you are an abuse victim. Uh, so that goes to several several of us here. But Ruby, let me get your thoughts. All right, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Nifertari brought something up about when you were explaining to someone about some trauma that you've dealt with. Um, and this kind of goes to my work. I used to explain to someone all the time, hey, you know, I had this, this has happened. I was actually abused. And they took that as like, oh, my God, I am now really stressed out because you told me this. Um, so I think ever since then, I've been very careful of what I say. Um, and then now that we're talking about boundaries and all that, for me, it's so hard to have boundaries because I'm such a people pleaser. And I have people walk all over me and I could care less as long as the other person's happy. And that has always been my struggle. I could be crying in a corner, but as long as my partner or my friend or my family member is okay, I'm, I'm happy about it. And I think, I don't know if I'm the only one like this, but definitely boundaries is my hugest struggle. No, you're probably, you're probably the majority in the group probably struggle with this whole self-love uh, concept. Uh, so as a piece of advice with this, um, an idea of what you can do is start trying to look at the self, the person you are inside, as a separate person from yourself. Because your tendency is to love everyone else and make sure everyone else is happy. You have to remember that anything you would do and give to someone else you have to give and do the equal amount for the self, for you. So start looking at that you almost like a separate person in the room, like a child that you have to care for. You literally need to care for the self like a child because you weren't parented properly in the first place. So you need to parent yourself. So you literally go, you're looking at your inner child and you're saying, oh, you know what? I don't care if someone walks on me. Well, do you care if someone walks on that child? Yes. You would never, yeah, you would never let someone walk all mm -hmm. over a child. I don't care if someone just takes from me and treats me like crap. Do you care if someone would take from that child and treat that child? Yeah, so that's why you got to take that person, put them outside of yourself, that your inner child, and look at it objectively. Treat your, yourself 
like it's a separate little inner child that you have to care for. And it helps you a little bit with this concept of how to have boundaries and self-love, protect that inner child like it's literally another child. Give it a name. Mine is called Roro. Lil Roro. Like I I can't let I can't let anybody mess with Lil Roro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if I look at it like that, I'm about it. Like I'm ready. <laughs> if it's just me, I'm like, oh whatever, kick me, hit me. I don't care. I was abused as a child. I can take it. Right? We gotta get out of looking at it like that. And you gotta give yourself that little separate child and don't let anything happen. You won't you would never let anything happen to a, to a separate child. Yeah. That's what helps you to be able to have the proper boundaries and to be able to figure out this whole self-love thing. Separate child. Um, I got some hands up here. Uh, Let's see, Jackie? Jackie, go ahead. Here we go, yeah, sorry. Um, I've, you know, I've been, I think because it's complex trauma, I keep struggling to figure out how I can fit what I have to say in with, with the points and it is too complicated, but, um, about six months ago, I set some, I tried to set, well, I did set a boundary with my mom about what I was willing to, I don't want to talk news and politics with her because she can't handle it. And she got so upset. It became this month long thing. And my dad called and told me I had to put up with being abused by her. And then she called me and told me that I couldn't be in her life anymore if I insisted on having healthy boundaries, basically. And it was so ridiculous that I, it made me finally realize that this has been going on my entire life. She's always been threatening to abandon me. She's, I think she's narcissist, very bad narcissistic personality disorder. Any of my values that didn't mirror hers weren't okay. And so all of everything we're talking about tonight, like, like just touches on so many nerves for me, but but what I've noticed is when I, I tell people about what happened with my mom, they just kind of look at me like, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal. My mom threatening to cut me out of her life forever because I set a boundary. I'm like, oh my God, no, this is huge. But but I guess like when you don't have, you know, the whole lifetime of experience in, in these ridiculous fights and, and things that have gone on my whole life to understand it, maybe it doesn't, it just sounds like we had a, like a silly little fight or something. And so I find that, that, um, I don't know, like I'm trying not to, I'm trying to find people like you guys and, and, um, you know, people that, that want to have a deep conversation about your trauma to talk about and, and then separate that from like other people. But I'm finding, I also have a problem with, I don't really understand because I'm, I'm very like a friendly and sociable person. And I've always tried so hard to be likable and lovable, but I, I have a problem maintaining friendships and I, I don't know. Like I have like like distant or you know like kind of the the level C friends, but I don't have like the very many close friends. And then when I do have a close friend, something always seems to happen and they disappear. And I think I must be trying to recreate this like abandonment problem that I have with my mom. I don't know, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's just complicated. But I know that like for her, like I guess I never set boundaries because deep down I knew that was going to be a huge problem, and then lo and behold, it was a gigantic problem. And now I'm not really sure what to do. So I've I've actually like pretty much cut off contact with my both my parents and my sister. And I mean, I wrote them a nice, you know, newsy letter that you would send to a, a distant relative or something. And um, and then I've just been ignoring them while I'm like, I need to heal because I'm just reprocessing like everything that's happened in my life that I blamed on myself. And like, oh no, I, they, my mom has a huge problem and my dad is telling me to put up with being abused. I'm like none of that is okay. So I don't know. I don't have a way to sum this all up, but but there's been some really great points tonight. So thanks everyone for Thank sharing you. and Roman for everything you've been saying. We we live your experience for the enabling parent that tells you, hey, you know, just just go ahead and, and deal with the deal with the abuse because it works for them. <laughs> that's how he, that's how your dad has survived the relationship is to just let mom do whatever mom's going to do. And so he thinks that everyone else should do that. But you're absolutely right to cut off uh, contact. And, um, yeah, people aren't going to understand from the outside who don't have abusive parents. Um, but uh, I love that you're writing letters, little newsletters uh, to everyone in the group, 
putting your, your communication in writing is a fantastic way to keep family at a distance and also have a written record of what was said so they can't twist everything up and they can't later say they didn't say something. So encourage them to communicate via email, text message, and, and, and an old-fashioned letter. That's a fantastic way to keep a certain distance from those toxic family members. So I'd say absolutely, absolutely keep that up so that you can continue to progress toward healthiness and and uh, and the peace and serenity that, serenity that comes from not being manipulated. Uh, Ruby, did you have a comment? Uh, no. <laughs> Your hand was up. <laughs> this is my first rodeo with um, doing all of this, so I'm kind of adjusting to the whole technology with the Zoom. So bear with me. <laughs> appreciate appreciate your guys' experiences and everything you're uh, you're sharing. I just want to make sure everyone's getting an opportunity. Does Does anyone else want to? Want to uh, share something or make a comment or ask a question? I just want to say thank you to everybody for sharing your personal experiences. Um, it helps. Um, and I know for people like me, especially, it does take a lot to share. And so I just want you all to know that you're valued and what you've been through is valued and we're all growing. Cheers to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very good. Um, Ed? Yeah, I just wanted to share to you that this was my first experience with this, and um, it's been absolutely amazing to listen and hear the things that people have to say, and just, you know, how relatable and just another resource that's out there. Um, to help people. And I'll definitely be sharing this with some friends of mine that are um, definitely in some mental health, can, you know, issues of their own that could really benefit from this as well. Thank you. We've appreciated your comments as well. Uh, Charlotte? Um, I would like to say that um, this is also my first, um, it's like a my first time in a group like this. And um, I did share with my husband that this is something that I would be doing. And he was super supportive about it. He didn't ask why he's not a pushy person. I think he felt like when the time was right, then I would speak to him about what's going on. He knows, he knows it's something, but I'm pretty headstrong when it comes to people um, forcing things on me probably because a lot of things were forced on me when I was younger. So, you know, put that guard up. So he's, he's very much aware of that, but I will also say that I've gotten more out of this hour and a half than I've gotten out of whenever I've seen a therapist. So this is just so, I appreciate this so much. And I look forward to each week after it, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I just, I, I feel so emotional right now because I feel like we have all just, had some big breakthroughs on here. And I feel like we all have this in common and it's it just feels great to be in a room with people that we share something and we understand and we're not being judged. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we all feel the same. Uh, for all of you guys here, you can do so much good by sharing uh, this group with others um, because uh, even if we, we get uh, a lot of people, we can start splitting into multiple days. Um, every, everyone that's here, I want to work with each and every one of you guys. Um, it's, uh, it's not a, a matter, like I say, my company that I'm setting up is about uh, giving free and affordable mental health care. Um, so it's not a matter that I would be charging you. Um, every client that I work with, I learn from. You guys teach me so much about what you're experiencing and what you're going through that I feel like I should pay you to work with you. So um, let me give you guys my some contact information. And I, I, hope, uh, I hope you guys reach out. Uh, you certainly don't have to. Um, you can text me. My phone number is 414-722-1400. Uh, 
one four five one. I'll try to try to write that. Uh, to see if I can create a a little chat box there, and then you can um, you can find a, a website mindfreed.org, uh, where you can go to to uh, get a free sample of uh, the services that we provide. Um, you can also um, email me at mindcured, M-I-N-D-C-U-R-E-D at gmail.com. Um, so hopefully you can find a comfortable way to reach out um, because literally there's not a person in this group that I don't want to continue the conversation with. It's just for the sake of time, for the sake of everyone's time that I have to end the meeting and stop and we have to go our separate ways. But I want it. You guys have more to say. Each of you have so much more to say that you didn't get a chance to to get in here. And I would like to give you that time. Um, if not with me, find another qualified therapist that you can work with. Um, otherwise, uh, if you're doing work on yourself, um, I just want to commend you. You are accessing your personal power to actually go into a group like this with all strangers. And then you guys shared with all strangers. That is fantastic. That shows me that you have the power you need to find yourself, to actually build, uh, design the person that you want to be, to spend the time working towards those values and living up to them. And you will experience peace. You will experience actualization. Uh, I pray that all of you guys can cut out uh, the toxic people in your lives, even when they're family members, to actually push them back as far as, as possible so that you have that space to just grow and to feel and to be yourself. I hope that those of us who struggle with self-love can can look at that person inside as a separate little child and care for that child and protect that child the same way we would protect another child. And uh, and I, I pray that this isn't the last time we all get to talk. So um, if you don't contact me, then I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, guys. This is great. All right, guys. Thank you so much. It was an honor.